Watch this. Oregon has um, very proudly provided abortion care to, to women from out of state. From out of state, as he said, in less than a month, women in Idaho are going to have to look outside of the state to seek an abortion after six weeks of pregnancy. That's because last week, Governor Little signed Senate Bill 1309 into law. In the meantime, providers in neighboring states like Oregon are bracing for impact and discussing how they will adapt to treating an influx of patients likely from Idaho. Here's Katya Stepovic. We are already seeing patients flying in from Texas. Um, I anticipate and we in our department anticipate that that will increase. Mark Nichols is a doctor of medicine and professor at the Department of OBGYN at Oregon Health and Science University in Portland. We're already seeing people drive in from um, Idaho to our facilities here at OHSU and, um, and to the, the Bend Clinic in Planned Parenthood. He says right now, Oregon provides about 6,000 abortions per year, and about 10% of those are from out-of-state patients. And he anticipates that the number of out-of-state patients will rise once Senate Bill 1309, banning most abortions in Idaho after six weeks, goes into effect. The closest clinic for um, folks in Idaho is a uh, Planned Parenthood clinic in Bend, Oregon. That's about 250 miles from Boise. So women will be facing a, you know, 500 mile round trip um, adventure to come and get abortion care. Women from Idaho will continue to seek abortions when they are facing um, an unplanned, undesired uh, pregnancy. And consequently, I'm sure they're going to be looking to us for, for, for care. While still in its early phases, OHSU and Planned Parenthood have plans to meet the increased demands. I do know that plans are being developed to provide services closer to the border, either directly in person or um, even across state lines via telemedicine. Mobile vans could be on the road tomorrow. Um, there are medical office buildings closer to the, the border that could be rented. He says about 70% of abortions in Oregon are done by medications that are FDA approved. The procedure can be provided solely by telemedicine. Right now, he has patients both in California and Washington using the out-of-state service. Idaho could be next. There is an evaluation that has to happen for patients to confirm that they're of a gestational age where this service can be provided. Um, that involves generally an ultrasound, but that can be obtained in, um, in Idaho. The medications then can be provided um, by mail to the patients. They're given very detailed and clear instructions as to um, what is likely to happen, what the complications might be, and then they take the medications at home and they expel the pregnancy. But 10 to 15 percent of patients are beyond that point in their pregnancy, where in-person visits are required, even for out-of-state patients. Those individuals will need more complicated care. Um, and right now, that is going to require a trip to, to Bend. Whether it's more clinics near Idaho's border or expanding telemedicine services, he says OHSU and Planned Parenthood will meet the demand for women in Idaho seeking abortions after six weeks. Abortion is health care. Just expanding health care is something that ought to happen. Also commented on the matter from their Bend location. They said in part, quote, they are expecting a dramatic increase in patient volumes. They say we want to have the ability to therefore care for our out-of-state neighbors while continuing to meet the needs of our patients in Central Oregon. They say we are training staff to be really better prepared so we can build our capacity for this very moment. All right, Katya, I'm getting a little closer to you because your microphone seems to have a little trouble, but I wanted to ask you this. So Dr. Nichols mentioned medications that could be mailed to a patient. We were talking about this, mm -hmm. whether or not that could actually happen to somebody in Idaho. Could somebody in Idaho ask for this medication to be mailed to them? 
Yeah, and it is a little bit of a gray area, right, because the patient would be taking it in-state, but the provider would be technically out-of-state, like you said. And according to Planned Parenthood's legal team, I want to read this, they said a provider cannot mail medication, abortion medicine, into the state because they would be practicing without a license, which is required in Idaho, and further, if they are licensed in Idaho, they are subject to Idaho laws and statutes, which in this case they cannot do. Okay, so that clears up. Just came in just a few moments ago, that text message, by the way, to help clear that up. Because that was a question we were wondering, like, is there a way that maybe somebody can circumvent this law by using this medication? As you said, Dr. Nichols said, a lot of his patients are choosing that method as opposed to a procedure. But that said, they can still go to Oregon and, and take the pill that way. Okay, thank you very much, Katya. All right, well, this week, Idaho lawmakers are expected to wrap up the legislative session. Thursday is the day circled in red on many calendars. And from there, many lawmakers and state politicians are going to go into full campaign mode, kind of make that transition. You can argue many of them already have been in that mode for quite some time, by the way. Have you seen the debates on the House floor? Seven weeks from today, Idahoans will vote in the primary elections. Truth in Idaho, though, Republicans pretty much dominate statewide political races, so there's a pretty good chance... The winners of the GOP primaries in seven weeks will go on to win that spot unless it's dominated by a Democrat right now. A major storyline to follow, campaign finance contributions. Joe Paris is tracking fundraising and the impact those funds have on the final outcome of the races. Question is, does raising more money mean a better chance of winning? Joe dives into the numbers for us. Money and politics, they go together like peanut butter and jelly, right? The two, just inseparable. And while correlation between fundraising and winning an election can vary, campaign finance reports give us valuable insight into candidates and political races. The highly anticipated May 2022 primary will set up the landscape of Idaho politics for years to come. The top race, Idaho's next governor. Top fundraisers in the race for Idaho governor include familiar names. Current Governor Brad Little, current Lieutenant Governor Janice McGeehan, and up-and-comer Ed Humphreys. According to the Idaho Secretary of State Sunshine reports, Little leads the pack with $1.63 million raised. McGeehan comes in at about $585,000 and Humphreys $314,000. The more money a candidate has, the more opportunity there is to expand campaigning. But it's not just about the money. Campaign finance reports give us a window into what support for a candidate may look like. In the governor's race, for example, on the Republican side, Little leads the way with donations from 2,151 donors. McGeehan has 1,217 and Humphreys has 494 so far. Important to note, though, donors are not necessarily Idahoans or Idahoans who are set to vote in May. People from outside the state can and do donate for a variety of reasons. Campaign donations are closely watched and must follow a very specific set of laws. For example, individuals can really only donate $5,000 per election on a candidate running for statewide office, like governor. Of note, races are split between the primary and general election, so people are allowed to donate for both of those races. Here's where some of the other major races sit, seven weeks from primary day. In the race for lieutenant governor, House Speaker Republican Scott Bedke holds a narrow fundraising margin over state representative Priscilla Giddings. Of note in this race, Giddings has 681 more individual donors, according to the Secretary of State's office. This is despite raising less. In the race for Secretary of State, Ada County Clerk Phil McGrain leads the GOP pack in donors and funds raised against state lawmakers Dorothy Moon and Mary Souza. The race for Idaho Attorney General currently has former Congressman Raul Labrador at the top of the chart for funds raised, close to $400,000. Current AG Lawrence Wasden does have more donors than Labrador and challenger Art McComber. With education in the spotlight, so is the race for Superintendent of Public Instruction. Challenger Debbie Critchfield leads the race in terms of funds raised and donors. Of note, SOS records show that current superintendent Sherry Ibarra has not filed an updated report since March 9th, so it's very possible her numbers are higher. But she does trail Critchfield and challenger Brandon Durst in both categories. There are dozens and dozens of races across Idaho for things like state lawmaker, county sheriff, even county coroner. Overall, across all the races, the Secretary of State's office has data that shows 41,866 donors have given $28,546,805 to 932 different candidates and 213 political action committees. Close to 18 million of all of those donations is for candidates running for office. 
So storyline we'll be following here on the 208 between now and May is what was more important, the amount of money raised or the amount of unique donors. Just one of the many storylines we'll be tracking for the next seven weeks when Idahoans go vote in the May primary. Oh, it's campaign season, and the latest social media spot for Lieutenant Governor Janice McGeehan, who's running for governor, is raising a lot of questions about the content and how it was obtained. All right, here's how you get involved with the 208. Text us, 208-321-5614. We want to see your comments, your questions, and your critiques. Just make sure to include your name in the hashtag, the 208. And remember, we're looking for clean, clever, and concise, so we can share a few of them at the end of the show. All right, late last week, Lieutenant Governor Janice McGeehan, who is running to replace Governor Brad, Brad Little, dropped a new campaign ad on social media. Maybe you saw it. She headlined it with this nugget. They can change the names all they want, but we'll keep exposing the indoctrination that is happening in Idaho schools. Hashtag critical race theory, hashtag CRT. And it featured our very own Joe Paris in the beginning, asking the governor why he signed House Bill 377 last year and if he believed it was actually happening in Idaho and needed it to be stopped or that it wasn't happening in Idaho and he just signed it because he wanted to make sure it would never happen. I'm, I'm definitely in the second camp. It's not happening in Idaho. In my signing statement of that bill, which I wasn't very excited about, I said what I really didn't like was the indication that it was a problem in Idaho. Along with the catchy music, the ad went on to repeat that sentiment right there and then point out that Governor Little is wrong. Spot went on to use edited clips pulled from a seven and a half minute YouTube video put together by Accuracy in Media, an organization that has been described as a conservative media watchdog group whose self-proclaimed mission is to promote accuracy, fairness and balance in news reporting. Let's put that in your pocket for a bit and we'll pull it out in just a moment. But the lieutenant governor's ad and this AIM video was centered on hidden camera interviews with several school districts around Idaho, Nampa, Caldwell, Boise, and Lakeland up north. According to the video, here's what we know. A couple claimed to be from Texas was planning to move to Idaho with their first grader. And according to the Nampa school district, this couple wanted to escape the quote unquote ultra conservative community in Texas, and they wanted to talk to someone about the district's curriculum, particularly critical race theory and social emotional learning. They did this with the three districts we mentioned, Nampa, Caldwell and Boise, and also up in Lakeland up north. But they didn't divulge their names, nor did they say what organization they were with, nor did they disclose they were shooting video of this conversation, just that they were parents, who wanted to talk curriculum. Here's a sample. So this dumb new law doesn't 
mess with you guys? Not yet. No. It's Social emotional them? learning. We can't say that here anymore. It's mental health. Oh, sorry. So. Yes. Oh my God. No, we did have a big. She already came for it. We already had a big blow up with that. So we still do. We just call it mental health. So it's just you know our mental health curriculum. I just went to a superintendent's meeting last week, and the district was intentional to switch out uh, social emotional learning to uh, behavior adaptations. Like they just hmm. changed the name? Changed the label, huh. same stuff. And I thought, it's kind of a bummer they have to do that, but yes. on the same hand, it's kind of brilliant. Heck yeah. <laughs> we should be able to teach the tenants kind of maybe associated with that, but under the guise of equity or something else. Can we do, do that? Yes, and we, well, we have, um, we're, we started, a part of our strategic plan de deals with equity. Good, and I bet the idiot MAGA crowd just ignores it because it doesn't have the critical race theory name on it, right? Yeah, there's. The, I, I hope so. Yeah. I, I hope so. You, you can tell by the questions and even the answers by Mark Jones there where they were hoping to lead the answers. Dumb new law, idiot MAGA crowd. That's the terms. Those are the terms they were using. And this would be a good time to point out Idaho is a one-party state, meaning only one party involved in an interaction has to be where it is being recorded if it is. So what they did wasn't exactly illegal. And that voice you hear in the background, the one asking the questions, is Adam Gillette, the president of AIM, the president, who apparently flew all the way from Florida to shoot this video. AIM claims to promote accuracy, fairness, and balance. balance. Remember, we mentioned that before. But Adam wasn't exactly accurate in portraying himself as a parent looking to move from Texas. Gillette, by the way, was one time vice president of Project Veritas, which is a right-wing media group who's been known to infiltrate progressive organizations to produce unflattering videos like this, and they've targeted teachers' unions before. We reached out to Gillette today to ask him some questions about this, but so far our email has gone unanswered. We did, however, speak with Dan Haller with the Boise School District, the same school district at the center of Representative Priscilla Giddings' scope last year when she claimed the district was riddled with critical race theory curriculum. Well, they opened it up to her, the entire curriculum, and nothing ever came from her claims. He said the same is true of these claims. You know, we stand by our record. We stand by that we are all about providing equitable education, that critical race theory is not presented in the Boise School District, that we have presented information to the indoctrination task force, Representative Giddings, they know full well that there is no record of that in the Boise School District. All of our curriculum is online. Anyone in the community can go online. We welcome uh, the uh, critique of that. Adam Gillette was the uh, gentleman recording and then putting this uh, video together. He said it's being hidden as something else, as this DEI, this diversity, equity, inclusion, this SEL, another acronym they like to use, uh, and basically saying uh, equity is kind of a thing uh, that is kind of this Trojan horse of getting CRT into the schools. Not true, not true at all. And in fact, we will, again, as I mentioned before, we will stand by our record. Equity to us in the Boise School District means if you are a student in the Boise School District, no matter where you came from, no matter who you are, no matter what your situation, we are gonna provide equitable programs to you, whether that's academics, whether that's athletics, activities, whether it's social services, those types of things. So everybody has an equal opportunity to succeed in life and college and career. That's what equity means to us. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really a shame. And it, it's really scare and shame tactics like this that are unfortunately standard practice in this environment now for those who thrive on conflict and chaos. And isn't that a sad commentary about where we are as a society? Well, if people have questions, we want to answer those but we also want people to be honest with us. And I bet the idiot MAGA crowd just ignores it because it doesn't have the critical race theory name on it, right? I mean, just the questions he, he went into this with obviously kind of led Mark down a path, it seems. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, misleading questions that he was looking for certain information and, and he was baiting people, I would say. I, I would go that far. Are you changing the name? Are you hiding it? No, we are not. We're not hiding it at all, no. Nope. What do you think about people taking this video and saying, see, I told you so? Well, I, this is the, the, the reason, the motivating factor for us to come on. And, and again, we appreciate the opportunity to set the record straight that um, uh, people can see the curriculum, people can see what we are teaching our students. And we work hand in glove with our parents uh, to make sure that they are aware of what's happening in the schools and that they can feel comfortable 
in asking questions of teachers, of our principals and administrators here and do so in a very honest and frank way. Um, and, uh, and that's who we are. By the way, Dan told us Mark Jones is the student programs administrator who's been with the Boise School District for more than 35 years. Mark told Dan that recorded conversation lasted about 10 to 15 minutes, so there was a lot left on the cutting room floor. Mark was on screen for less than a minute. The Napa School District also responded to the video with this. The district's SEL curriculum does, does include many mental health topics, so is often identified as both SEL and mental health curriculum. The district has not changed the name of SEL. Rather, adding the words mental health seeks to help clarify what is being taught. The Napa School District does not now, nor has it ever, ascribe to a position of teaching content that is objectionable to our community. Our top priority is providing a safe and enriching environment where children can learn and prepare for the next stage of life. And then we got this from the Caldwell School District, their response. Social emotional learning has become a contentious phrase being used by conflict entrepreneurs to promote division inside and outside of this state. This is exemplified in the accuracy in media reporters gotcha style approach to this interview with the video camera hidden. We were and continue to be open and honest about our approach to ensuring our students are successful. SEL is a broad term that covers a variety of skills and knowledge and means different things to different people, they said. It may also look different in different school systems. If there are components of the social emotional health materials the Caldwell School District is using that are concerning to parents, we invite them to share their concerns and we will gladly address them. And again, we reached out to Adam Gillette to see if he had anything to say about this video and this being used as perpetuating this C, told you so. And he has uh, yet to respond to our email. So it appears, though, accuracy in media seems to be playing loosely with this accuracy thing. And it also seems to be promoted by our lieutenant governor.
Viewer questions makes the 208 go round. We got this one from a viewer. Would like to update, on, like an update, I should say, on the public swimming pool in Caldwell. Last year, it was closed all summer due to some repair that would cost a large amount of money. Well, since it's the only public pool in the city of Caldwell, we were wondering if it would be open this summer or if a new pool is being built. Well, the city, here's your answer. The city closed the pool in 2021 because of an electrical issue that would have been costly and it was decided they were going to move forward with spending money on a new pool instead as opposed to repairing the aging facility. Since then Caldwell City posted an update on the future of the city's pool on their website. We want, looked at that today and they say the current pool scheduled to be demolished this past winter. Good news is the plan is to replace it with a new one and it's expected expected to be larger than the original pool. So you have that to look forward to. However, it's not expected to be done until the summer of 2023. So you got to get through this summer first, but there's an update for you. All right, quick time for your comments here at the end of the show, like this one sent in from Jen. So far, the abortion bill targets women and the doctor who performs it. Where is any punishment for the men involved in these pregnancies? It's not like we get pregnant alone, asks Jen. That's a very good question, but even they could sue the doctor if they perform an abortion. Dan Hollers a Jem, thank you for pulling back the curtains on these scurrilous tactics. Good job. Clean and concise, says Tam. That's right. You know, you record, but can you put individuals in ads without their permission? Yeah, you can. See you tomorrow.